was such a sweet uh, time of worship, wasn't it? Uh, Johnny's usually a pretty big distracting with his awesome, you know, drumming skills. <laughs> it's real nice to just, you know, give God all our full attention, right? Oh, man. Uh, I don't really have a lot of announcements this morning for y'all. Um, I was reminded this, uh, this morning in first service that they're, I think, finally taking that main uh, street bridge down next weekend. So prepare for that. Um, if, y'all, if y'all haven't seen that, that's going to be a mess. Uh, but once they get it all down, it'll be, be good, right? And I think what what's next is Bucky's. So I think if that's still happening, who knows? <laughs> oh man! Um, but uh, right, uh, and then of course uh, back to school, right? And I know not all of us have kids that are going back to school, but uh, there's all if there's one thing we all have in common is now having to deal with school traffic again, right? <laughs> that is fantastic and awesome all the time. <laughs> uh, but I mean. I did want to just uh, take time this morning to pray for uh, for some of the kids that are either already back in school as this past Wednesday or going into school this uh, upcoming week and for our administrators and our teachers. Um, I know the last two years has been kind of a little, maybe even confusing at times for parents, grandparents, and kids have just been resilient, right? They've continued to press on and really just take on every school year um, the best way possible. And even this school year might have even some uncertainties and some questions behind it. So um, I think it'd just be appropriate to pray for this upcoming school year and uh, just, you know, know that God has it all in his wonderful, merciful plans. Will you join me? Uh, Heavenly Father, just uh, thank you so much for uh, this area and this state that we live in. God, just thank you for the uh, wonderful and amazing uh, school districts that are in our area that we have the absolute pleasure to be a part of, uh, Comfort, Bernie, uh, North San Antonio, uh, uh, Fredericksburg, and uh, just our surrounding areas. God, we have such school, such amazing, great school districts around us, and we have such great uh, people in in charge and authorities making the best decisions they know how. God, but we just join them in prayer this morning uh, that they might uh, seek you and you first. God, and just continue to wrap our kids and the students, um, in your love and in your grace, God, they've already um, dealt with the last two years of confusion with such uh, poise um, and just uh, such a wonderful attitude and smile. Um, God, and may we just uh, continue to come alongside our administrators and our teachers as they do their the best that they know how to teach our kids to come to work as well with a smile on their face and to teach uh, to their very best ability. God, we just know that um, everything is in your uh wonderful, wonderful uh, plans, God, and we know that you're gracious, we know that you're good, and you are also attentive, and so you are uh, really paying attention, and uh, just want the very best for us, and we thank you. Amen. In Hebrews uh, one eleven, um, scripture says, right, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and is the evidence of things not seen, and I know, you know, none of us were here alive to see the uh, crucifixion, right, and the burial and the resurrection, <laughs> but it is through faith, right, um, that we that we believe that. And so my hope is in the cross this morning. Um, my hope is in a God that was crucified, was buried, and was resurrected, that lives in me. And so I take the bread this morning with hope and faith, knowing that my God is that good. Will you join me? And the blood that was shed for my sins and yours, that represents the new covenant. You take and drink. Thank you, God. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. i glad to see you. When I first came in the auditorium after Sunday school, I thought there was just going to be four of us. Um, I knew a lot of people were going on vacation and trying to um, get out of town uh, one last time. Um, And then um, our second hour praise team got hit by COVID a couple weeks ago, so they're still 
several people uh, isolating from that just out of an abundance of caution and all of that. So we're glad that you're here. And um, for those who are joining online, we welcome you. Um, glad you could be with us. Um, I know everybody wants to know how Vanessa's doing. She had her surgery Friday, um, and uh, it did take longer than anticipated. Um, originally, the surgeon told me about five hours, and it ended up taking about seven and a half hours, but um, he's very, he's has a reputation for being slow but cautious, and uh, you know, I'm like, well, I prefer slow and cautious over expedient. And he um, only does one surgery of that kind a day. So he didn't have anything following. So I like that, super slow. Um, but if you want to see a picture of what is in her back, that's what it is. Um, he um, is using a new procedure. He went in the side of her stomach and does most of the work in there so he doesn't have to cut the main back muscle. And then after he got all everything in there and situated, then he turns her over and then puts a couple of cuts in the back where he can insert the screws. And so when he got in there, he said he realized he needed to put a, neck, a disc in there, that um, a spacer so that it could take the pressure off the nerves. And then he goes, I did some carpentry, hi. Uh, <laughs> built this structure around that, around the spine to give it more stability so that she doesn't have problems, hopefully, in the future. So it's amazing what they can do, right? But um, after seven and a half hours of being out, um, she had a tar hard time, you know, um, getting it together. So um, uh, yesterday, she slept a lot, but they worked on getting her off uh, the morphine pump, and um, now she's just waiting for her bowels to wake up. The doctor said, uh, once you can pass gas, um, then you can go home. I said, well, I can take care of that for you right here. <laughs> I mean, like... <laughs> Just say the word. We can make this happen. But she said, no, that's, that's not what he meant. And it's not if someone can pass gas, it's if I can pass gas. So um, I'm sure she'll appreciate me saying that. Um, <laughs> but so we're hoping that, uh, that tomorrow she can come home. And you know how it is. Uh, they're giving her great care, um, you know, Every been super attentive and super good, but you know, at a hospital they wake you up every hour and a half, um, so you don't get much sleep. And um, um, we're hoping that she can come home tomorrow. So we appreciate all of your prayers and um, care. So uh, the song selection, of course, as always, was perfect. Delaying um, last week, uh, we we went through this continuing progress through um, John chapter number 15. And uh, we saw that he says, listen, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's hard for us because we think there's a lot we can do. But in an eternal perspective, a, a thing that can bear actual fruit, uh, we can't do it. And God never intended for us to do it. He, he wants us to realize that we have been created to be a people that live in utter dependence upon him always. Um, and when we live out of our own resources, when we live for ourselves, uh, he tells us, listen, that um, it all burns up. It's wood, hay, and stubble. It doesn't mean that we won't go to heaven because our salvation is not dependent on what we do. Uh, our salvation is dependent on what he has done. It is a gift that we receive. 
Um, and we remember that John 15 is not talking about salvation. It's talking about fruit bearing. So you have to, you have to keep the verses in context. But he says what we do in self-sufficiency is like wood, hay, and stubble. It goes through the fire, and it burns up. It puffs up. You, you, you can go to heaven smelling like smoke. But why live a wasted life? Because he came to be more than just our Savior. Uh, I, I did rant a little bit last week, which is a rare thing. I hardly ever do it more than once a week. But Jesus didn't come just to be your ticket to heaven. He came to be life itself. That Christianity is more than just a change in destination. He came to be our whole source for living. And so we as disciples have a choice to live from the vine and to experience him producing fruit through us. Or we can choose to live in self-sufficiency and see all of our works go up in smoke. Now, today I want us to look at the great privilege that we have been blessed with, to come to him with confident expectation. And I know it's going to come as a great shock, but today we're going to cover three whole verses again. Um, if you know me, you know that I would have the ability to cover just one verse, but... Uh, for the sake of expediency and the hope that I will finish the Gospel of John before the second coming of Christ, um, I upped it to three verses. So he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Well, Father, um, I pray that we were thoughtful even as we sang and um, praise and worship to you. Because um, everything we sang should have prepared our hearts for what you want to do in us and through us. Lord, that we would have ears to hear and hearts to obey, to live uh, in yielded surrender to you, our vine, our source, for all. And I pray that you would bless this time and show me exactly what you'd have me to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, you know, if you're following week after week, you're thinking like, he sure uses the same words over and over again. He tells us to abide, and then two verses later, he says, abide, and then he says, abide, and Abide. And I think the reason Jesus is emphasizing this is that we have a tendency, all of us, to kind of live on autopilot. To kind of just let life go, doing what we do just because that's what we want to do. And before you know it, um, we're just thinking of Jesus as kind of our helper. Like, well, Jesus is my co-pilot, um, and whenever I get lost or need a little help because I've created some chaos, then I'll say, okay, Jesus, uh, I'm inviting you to come in. But he's saying, no, 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 no. That's not the way I want to do this. I want you to realize that I died for you so that I could live in you so that I might express my life through you. I'm not asking you to live the Christian life. I'm not giving you a new set of rules and regulations where you call upon me for help when you can't do it. He said, you can't do it. But I can do it through you. And so he says again, abide in me. Now, it says, if you abide in me, and 
we automatically think of this as some kind of a condition. But in the Greek, the word that we translate if can also be translated since. And so it is true that it's conditional. Like if you don't abide in him, well, then you're just going to make a disaster out of life. Um, if you don't live from him as the source, well, you're going to bring chaos and destruction and you are not going to bear fruit. You can, you can go to church, you can be religious, you can put on a facade, you can wear a mask, you can do a lot of pretending, right? You can do that, uh, one that I really hate uh, when I hear people say, well, just fake it till you make it, right? Well, you can do that, but you're never going to make it by faking it. it, it you really only make it when you face it. When you realize in and of myself, I can't do it, but since I live in him, since I find him as my source. You see, remember that abiding in Christ is living a life of complete dependence upon him. And I had some really interesting conversations during the week from the last week's message, and, and one of the guys uh, uh, talked to me, I guess it was Wednesday, and we were talking, he's like, well, listen, and he's a surgeon, right? And he goes, on surgery days, I always feel a little tense. And he said, so uh, on, I think it was Tuesday, he had a surgery day, he goes, so on Tuesday, I went in, and I said, Lord, I'm abiding in you. Everything that needs before me, every challenge that I face, I'm just going to let you live through me, just guide me. He goes, I was intense all day. He goes, and everything went well. And then uh, someone else was talking about, like, like, I'm doing this for everything now, even my golf game. And I said, well, good, because really there's nothing we do that we should do apart from him. Because he said, I came to be the source. So since you abide in me should be our first thought. Lord, I do now abide in you. I am dependent upon you for everything. I'm, it, see, because our tendency would have fall back on our own wisdom and our own knowledge and our own experience and then live life apart from him. And he's saying, don't do that. Find me to be your source. Because, friends, we can live a religious life without abiding. But we can't experience the fruit of the Spirit apart from abiding. You see, you can follow rules. You can do all the things. You can do the right things and, the, and not the wrong things. But you cannot express fully love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, and self-control apart from him. And see, your, your natural fleshly response is, well, I'm not a kind person. And that's just the way I am, so get used to it. Well, of course, that's not the kind of person you are. Okay. But that's your excuse? Because you weren't left to your own resources. You said, well, I, I just, I'm not a loving person. Well, that's a bunch of nonsense. If Christ is your life, then you have the full capacity to be a vessel of love. And why would you settle for anything less? We're called to live in his presence moment by moment, and not by our traditions or our habits. As we abide in him, our hearts become in tune to his will, and our desires become transformed or conformed to his image. And so he says, since, since you abide in me and my words abide in you. So instantly we begin to see that there is this beautiful relationship between the living word and the written word. He's saying, listen, you got to have both. Uh, because if all you have is the written word, you can have an orthodox 
faith without the expression of Christ. You can have a good doctrinal statement, but not be a disciple of Jesus. He says, let my words live in you. Let them let them teach you so that you might know to pray according to his will. To have his word abide in us is to be settled on what we know he's teaching us, what he's calling us to. When we allow his word to abide in us, it, 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 it uh, restrains our selfish desires. It points out and reveals the ways in which our lives have not been conformed uh, to his image. His Holy Spirit breathes through our whole being and without our even being conscious of how our desires as the breathing of the divine life are in conformity to the divine will. When his word abides in us, we, we seek the glory of God. As we abide in Christ and his word in us, the soul learns not only to desire, but also to discern spiritually what will be for God's glory. As soon as a church, a, a movement, a denomination de-emphasizes the written word, it will quickly fall apart. I mean, you can look at certain denominations that, you know, a generation or two ago were boldly preaching the gospel, and now you see utter nonsense coming out of them, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I had a friend talk to me about they, how he had to resign from his church because they had decided they were going to uh, officiate uh, same-sex marriages and allow, you know... Um, uh, homosexual pastors, and he goes, I just can't do it. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm glad that you allowed the written word to interact with the living word to reveal to you discernment about what truth is. It's not about not being a loving person. It's about discerning what is true. He says, listen, you got to find me to be your source. you got to be me because otherwise the... The, the, the standard will lead you astray. The enemy will deceive. And so let his word sink in deep into your heart and mind. And he says, ask whatever you wish. So find life in him. Let him be your source. Let his word live in you. And then whatever you wish ask. In the Greek, it's interesting because he puts this, in English, they, 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 they turn it around, ask whatever you wish. But in Greek, it says, whatever you wish, ask. And it's an imperative. So it's a command. He's saying, listen, live in me, find life in me. Let my word live in you. Whatever you wish, ask. You see, now, if you took this in isolation, out of his context, you could say, well, you know, um, you know, Lord, uh, give me a Lamborghini. Or, Lord, uh, give me a bigger house. Lord, give me... And we would think that all of a sudden we've got a formula that whatever we want for our selfish pursuits, we just ask and God's got to do it. Because have you ever thought about, like, what prayer is all about? See, some people approach prayer like a to-do list. Ha have any of you ever had a to-do list? Now, some of you know. We talked about it last week, right? Some of us like lists because it makes us feel really good that we've accomplished something. Um, some people uh, get a, what was that called? A honeydew. Um, anybody ever have a honeydew? Okay, there's a few of you who are brave enough to raise your hand, right? And, and what is that? That is the list um, by which your spouse has uh, come alongside to help you understand uh, that which is necessary for your happiness. 
And, and the intention of the list is for you to be able to go down and, and check off that list. And when you have that, you think, well, it's all done and I'm free from here. But it's not because once you start living by a list, it's ever expanding. And so we approach our prayer life as though it was a list of instructions, the things that God needs to accomplish in order for us to be happy. And so we give him the news, all the news at six, as though he was uninformed. I mean, think about it. Well, Lord, I just wanted to let you know that. And we tell him everything that's going on as though he was preoccupied with other things and needed us to inform him of what's going on. Well, friends, he's God and he knows everything. And prayer is not us giving instructions to the almighty as though he was our servant. As though he was responsible to do whatever we wanted to do. Prayer is all about us coming to the place in utter dependence to discover what he wants to do in me, what he wants to do through me. And so prayer needs an essential part of listening. Now, I was thinking, I think everybody knows that one person who just loves to talk and, like, never stops, right? So my, 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 my wife and I were with another couple and having dinner some time ago, and um, my wife is much more social than I am. Everybody kind of thinks, well, you're the extrovert. But I'm not an introvert. She's an extrovert. She loves to be around people. She can listen to people for hours on hours. And just. And so we go, with, and, and this one person just. And they asked me a question. And I thought, okay. Well, and before I could start answering, they started talking again. And this went on for two and a half hours. And finally, I said, you know, um, I'm really tired. We need to go. I walked out and I said, babe, can we not do that again? Please? And she's like, oh, honey. You know, she just needed to get a lot off her mind. And Please, honey, don't make me do that again. Oh, honey. You know, my wife's so sweet and nice. and oh, It's disgusting. And I thought to myself, you know, that was really frustrating for me because if you ask me a question, I'm happy to answer it. But don't ask me a question and then answer it. And I thought, you know, that must be how God feels. Because sometimes prayer is like, okay, Lord, well, uh, first, you need to straighten out all my kids. Because, you know, this one's doing this and this is and, and And then you need to, and amen, and then we go off. No, prayer is me listening. Lord, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? How do you want to give? How do you want to manifest your life through me? It's not a list of things that I want. Whatever you wish, he says, ask. Discover what he's doing and ask how you can be a part of it. How he's working in the world and we can trust that he's transforming our will when we live from him and his word lives in us. It's not so much about things that we're trying to get. It's our deepest connection to the vine where we hear his will and we yield ourselves to him. Lord, what do you want, to, what do you want me to do in response to this need? I mean... Almost every day, I get some kind of request from India or Sri Lanka, from the pastors that we're working with, and they'll have this need or that need, or they want to do this or that, and they, they send me this request. 
And I used to get like overwhelmed because the need seemed so great and my ability was so limited. But now I just say, okay, Lord, here's this request. What do you want to do for me? What do you want to give through me? How do you want to speak through me? And the pressure's off. Why? Because I'm living in him. I'm not trying to do it on my own. I'm not responsible. I'm just trying to say, Lord, what do you want to do? How do you want to give? What do you want to say? That's all I have to do. He goes, and it will be done for you. You see, when I live in surrender to his divine presence, I can have great confidence that he will work in me and through me. When I ask him, Lord, what do you want me to say here? I can be confident that he's going to show me what to say. When I ask him, Lord, what do you want to do here? I can be confident that he's going to reveal to me what he wants to do through me. When I say, Lord, there's a need here. How would you like to give through me? What sh what's my part in this? Well, I can be confident that he will do it, that he will reveal it. Because I'm abiding in him and his word is abiding in me. And he says, by this, my father is glorified. I loved how it, God shows us how everything the son did, he did for the glory of the father. It was first in all of his heart. It was first in all of his actions. The son lived for the glory of the father. He lived to do his will. And of course, that makes sense that the son of God would seek the will and purposes of the father. But should it be any different with us? Should our lives not be, should our hearts first thought not be Lord what glorifies you in the way I live and the way that I speak and the way that I act, the way that I live and interact in the world, my first thought should be my king and his kingdom. My first thought should be what brings glory to him, to live for the glory of God, to do his will. And when we allow his life to flow through us, we bring glory to his name. It's really not about doing great things for God, but allowing God to do great things through us. You see, every single one of us, our lives have meaning and purpose. I mean, somehow we got this thing all mixed up and we have this idea, well, there are certain people who are servants of God. They're, they're kind of the elite uh, special forces that are over here and, and they're dedicated and they do whatever God wants and the rest of us are over here and we come to church once in a while when we feel like it and, and we sure hope that guy doesn't preach too long and we well, can always hope. And... Um, and we and just like help me to feel good about things and, and you know lord how do i have my best life now but just pretty much leave me alone until i go to heaven but man friends that's that that's nowhere in the scripture he says that when we find life in him we recognize that whether we're a bus driver or a servant whether we're retired or we're an accountant, no matter what we do in our work or our play or all of life, that our life has meaning and purpose, and it should all work to bring glory to the Father. We glorify him when we reveal his character and worth. See, it's very different than religion I've been around a lot of religious people my whole life I've been around very few people who know how to know how to love well I mean I know people who can follow the rules they are rule keepers but that's really not what makes you a disciple is it and see so I've been rethinking in my mind, what is discipleship really all about anyway? 
Because in our Western model, we made discipleship all about learning facts. All about having the right doctrines. All about having the, the right ideas, the right practices, practices, the right methodologies. To know what a, a good Christian does and what a good Christian doesn't do. Is that what a disciple is? You see, a disciple is really, at its core, one who is a committed follower of his teacher, who incorporates into their life the lifestyle of their teacher, who adopts the actions and attitudes of their teacher. You see, that's why it's very important for us to remember that our discipleship is reflected when we share his character, when we look, act, sound like Jesus, when we bring about his praise, his honor, and his excellence in the way that we live. He says that you bear much fruit. Remember, through religious effort and self-discipline, we can produce fake fruit. But we cannot produce authentic love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, and self-control. We can put a facade of certain things, but he says, listen, this is my desire for you that you would become vessels that manifest, that express my life in a hurting world. And so prove to be my disciple. So what, again, is the evidence of our being disciples? To bear much fruit will make it manifest that we are his disciples. The evidence of Christ living through us shows that we are disciples, that we're branches living out of the vine. A disciple is someone who yields to it yields all to the indwelling life of Jesus. The disciple is the one who says, I do surrender all. Lord, here I am. What do you want to do through me? Here I am, Lord. What do you want to give through me? Here I am, Lord. What do you want to say through me? You see, if we live these self-willed, self-directed, self-pleasing, self-whatever lives, we're only fooling ourselves that we're disciples. Even the son, as he gets ready to go to the cross, comes into the garden and he says, Lord, is there some other way? Can you take this cup from me? But not my will, yours. But not my will, yours. But not my will, yours. And so you see, friends, that Jesus models for us the, the life of absolute surrender. The evidence of Christ living through us shows we are disciples that live from the vine that we've committed our lives to following his way. And I think that some of us would prefer just having a good doctrinal statement because we have no intention of reflecting him. And our lives bear little resemblance to him. Way back there, two whole chapters ago, where were we? What? 
what was that, like six months ago, something like that. John 13, I probably should review it for you since I was joking with everybody like um, my brain is like an Etch-a-Sketch. Do you guys remember what Etch-a-Sketches were, right? You just shake it and everything's gone. Um, <laughs> who told me that? Um, was, it, was it Rick? Somebody said that they, someone gave uh, their kids an Etch-a-Sketch and the kids were looking at it, the grandkids were looking at it and saying, hey, how do you turn this thing on? <laughs> um, this generation's in trouble, man. But just for review, right, because it was, you know, two whole chapters ago, uh, John 13, 35 says, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So Jesus says to them, and these are the guys that have been following him for three and a half years. Hey, he said, listen, now, now listen, guys. Uh, the people out there are going to look in at you and say, oh, those people are followers of Jesus. You know how we know? They love one another. And so like we talked about before, if my wife, if my neighbors, my children, my coworkers, if the people surrounding me only have one adjective to describe my life. What adjective will that be? And when it is love, then we can say with confidence that our discipleship is evident. The evidence of our discipleship is not the number of verses that we have memorized. The evidence of our discipleship is not the orthodoxy of our doctrinal statement. The evidence of our discipleship is the way in which we have learned to surrender to the indwelling presence and become vessels that express love. Well, you say, well, you know, but yeah, that love thing, you know, some people are just better at it. Well, maybe. So that's our excuse? You see, we, we're all kind of wired different, and some things come more natural to some people than other people, for sure. But this is all about what? Abiding in him. When... You're the branch drawing life from the vine. You can do nothing but bear what the vine is. And God is love. You see, God is love and there's no way to be his disciple without being impacted by his love and loving others. There is no other distinctive that really matters. And I, I think I told you guys this once before, you know, uh, I remember in seminary, uh, well, actually it was a, a Bible college class that I took and they had this whole course on the Baptist distinctive because they were wanting to make sure that we'd be good Baptists, right? So we needed to know the Baptist distinctives. And they're all good things, right? Like the Bible is your sole authority and, you know, lots of good things. And uh, I, I, I never forget one of the churches that I would go to when we were living in Colombo, Sri Lanka, right? We'd walk up the steps and it, and it said, distinctively Pentecostal. You know, and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, and I, I knew what that meant, right? And so it doesn't matter what denomination, right? They all got their distinctive. Until one day it struck me that, you know, we all got a problem. I don't care if you're Baptist or Pentecostal or Methodist or Episcopal. I don't care. We got a problem. Because none of our distinctives include love. We have a distinctive, man. We speak in tongues, man. And we got a distinctive. Uh, we only drink grape juice. Uh, I, 
I really don't care about any of it if we don't know, if we're not known by how we love one another. You know, in the end, if you just think about it, the scripture reminds us over and over. He says, listen, if you don't love, you're just a clanging symbol. You're just a lot of loud noise. The world isn't going to be transformed by us winning the argument. I mean, don't you, I mean, you got to, you got to admit, like, you love to win the argument. Well, don't you? I mean, I like to win once in a while. I mean, I started pre doing some premarital for a brand new couple, and I don't know why God does this to me. <laughs> so I look at the kid, and I'm like, well, you know, kid, he's 20-something years old. I'm like, dude, here's the, here's the basic. <coughs> Basics, number one, truth. You got to get this settled. You can be right or you can be happy. You choose. <laughs> you can be right, or you can be happy. But here's the deal. It's not about being right. It's about loving. I mean, think about it. Jesus was never wrong. Never. But he never insisted on being right. Everything he did, he did as an act of love to bring glory to the Father. We will not transform the world. We will not impact our community and the world that we live in until love becomes our mission and our priority. And him who is love lives in us so that he can love through us. Love is it all. He says, as the Father has loved me. Isn't that great? How does the Father love the Son? So like step one is we got to grasp real quick the love the Father has for the Son because it's the same love the Son has for the believer. When we put the focus on ourselves, we have a great deal of trouble conceiving how He could love us, but He draws us to the relationship between the Father and the Son so that His invitation to live in His love is an invitation that we must accept. We know God is love, but we have so little faith and such a distorted view of God that we don't accept it by faith. We think he must somehow have certain conditions on how he loves us. We, we, we think, that well, there must have been way too many failures today for God to possibly love me. But he doesn't love you because of what you did or what you didn't do, he loves you because you are his. Everybody who's had a kid knows that you love that kid for no other reason than it's yours. I mean, like, the, the whole thing, right? Like, as I remember the, like, the new parent thing, you know, like... This is back in the day, right? Like, we had to take real pictures, and we had to get the film developed. And I mean, like, it was no easy process to torture people uh, to make them look at your pictures of your beautiful children. I mean, your incredible, beautiful, wonderful children. And like, you know, you go to work, and you're like, here, do you want to see 158 pictures of my child and how beautiful they are? And they're looking at your kid, and they're going like, I, you know, uh... I'm not quite seeing it. It looks like the... <laughs> How long has this big kid been soaking in pickle juice, you know? And will its head ever come back into a normal shape? Or You don't think about that. You're the parent. You love this kid. It's yours. And what do kids do for you? Horrible things horrible 
You know, you could be holding a kid, right? Just having a great old time. And they'll just puke on you without even thinking twice. No, I'm serious. I, I, you know what I mean? Like, what are you doing? You're just loving this kid. What did they do? <laughs> and they don't go, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> if they're not puking on you, they're emitting stuff out the other end that is just truly obnoxious. I mean, it's, it's just like disgusting. That's what I love about being a grandparent. I had my four-month-old grandson, and I was holding him and kind of rocking, and he loves it when you go, you know, I, I don't know, but he loves that. And I was like holding him, and all of a sudden, the backside, it started feeling warm and squishy. Now, if I was a parent, I would have no choice but to have to deal with that toxic waste. But in this case, I said, you know, he needs his mom. <laughs> and, and my daughter-in-law did what every good mother does. I mean, she just took them and cleaned them all up and said, okay, you can go back to pops, you know? I mean, but that's love. Why? As the father loved the son, the son loved you abide in my love you see john is an amazing apostle right he writes this incredible gospel he writes those the epistles of john uh, he he records the revelation of jesus christ and he never identifies himself as an apostle he never even calls himself john he only refers to himself as him whom Jesus loved. How transformative would it be if we chose to simply live as him whom Jesus loved? He says, abide in my love. Who's before him when he says this? Peter, Peter, who's going to deny him three times. He says, abide in my love. Thomas is there full of doubts. And he says, abide in my love. Philip was unsatisfied. He says, show us the father. He says, abide in my love. Hear the heartbeat of God beating love for you. And then we're liberated to remove all of the conditions that we put on loving others. To live out of his love. The only way to truly know Christ is through understanding his love. To know that his love is is behind everything he does, even his wrath. We may not understand it, but his discipline is an act of love. But here's the thing. Abiding requires a monogamous relationship. We fail to abide in his love because we have too many other lovers. We love our possessions, and we allow them to rob us of the one true love. We've convinced ourselves that our materialistic expectations are perfectly reasonable. And this is where we have committed spiritual adultery. We've bought the lie that we have every right to live self-directed, self-absorbed lives. We even have created a Christianity 
that, ma that exalts materialism. We find, we, we, we've rewritten the word to rationalize our covetousness. We think that things will satisfy. We think that things will give us security. And he said, that's not abiding. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. To live in his life. In fact, some of us have settled for religion so we can feel smug in our materialism and our self-righteousness. We can't abide in his love while we're sleeping with many other lovers. When our pursuit is other He says, abide in my love, because only then will you be satisfied. Live in my love, because only then you will know that you do now have everything you will ever need. It isn't a love that has its source in you. It's a love that has its source in you. In him. Abide in me. Let my words abide in you. Just as my father loved me, I love you. Live in my love. And this is what it is to glorify God. Father, thank you for your love for us. We choose to live in that love and our desire is to be vessels of that love to be known as a people who love well.